So uh, thanks for uh, inviting me out to IBM's uh, research center. This is a real thrill for me because I've heard about this research center all my life. I used to live, I lived here in the valley for 35 years and I heard about the disk drive being manufactured here and the it's database a thrill for me too. being, I mean there's all sorts of blue lasers we're inventing here. Mm -hmm. right? so it's a thrill for me too, coming here every day to work. Yeah. So who are you? My name is Shiv and I'm one of the researchers here in computer science software. Um, um, larger Almaden is divided into four parts. I'm okay. one of those four parts. And, <clears throat> the and other three parts are Almaden CS uh, storage, then there is Almaden services sites, and Almaden science and technology. Yeah. And so you're in the computer science? I'm in the computer science software site. The, the really geeky side, right? The really geeky side. <laughs> <laughs> the site that actually invented the relational databases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> That's a long history. There's a lot to live up here. Yes, you? there is. Uh -huh. um, it, tell me where you came and how did you get here? This is like um, the Super Bowl, right? Working yes, for yes, IBM yes. A um, couple of different things. One is um, I, I actually started my career as a visiting faculty. Uh, that's what I thought I wanted to do initially. Um, and I spent about a year and then I realized that I actually wanted to build things. So I moved from there to digital. I started my career in Digital Equipment Corporation. Yeah. You told uh, me you worked at AltaVista, right? Yes. So um, Digital Equipment Corporation was, that was the time in which AltaVista was getting invented. Yeah. And around that time AltaVista Alta got invented and we spun off a group to form the AltaVista company. I was part of the original AltaVista company. I was there. And then Alta Vista was getting discussed to be sold off, etc. I left at that point in time and came over and joined IBM. I joined IBM in 1998. So you left them before Google even came out, right? Yes, I had left them before Google came out. That's Good right. move. We, now we know you're brilliant. <laughs> Get off Google the second ship before anybody even realizes there's a hole in the hole, right? <laughs> Google started in 1999, 1998 I was here. Yeah. Wow. Um, tell me a little bit, so the, it, how did that work at Alta Vista, because that's on large scale data yes. center computers, yes. how did that, uh, are you using any of that kind of work here or, or are you doing something completely different now? Um, conceptually, what we're doing over here is similar in the sense that we're still trying to make sure that people get the information that they want. Okay? Yeah. Um, right from the days of Alta Vista, it was very, very clear that as the data sets get larger, even with smaller data sets, for people to be able to find what they want even with a very, very tiny amount of data, becomes much harder. Because there is a gap between what the users want and the way they think and the way in which machines can answer the question. Okay? This has been the problem all along in almost any search engines. So a lot of the experiences that we got over there and the downfalls that we had over there, we've tried to translate into learning experiences and actually go ahead and build something new over here. Interesting. Uh, so what, what, are you, what kinds of things are you working on? What, what gets you jazzed up in the morning, I guess? Um, a couple of different things. One is the excellent group that works for me. Yeah. So that's part of the... Which group? My whole group. Okay, what's it called? A okay. bunch of, we are the search and analytics group ah, over okay. here. We do unstructured information management. And the group that we have is uh, one of the best in the world. So that does get me jazzed up to come here every day. Uh, obviously, the work that we do. Uh, our focus is on being able to do smarter analytics that's pull out very, very specific pieces of information from text, and then be able to surface that and make a better job of actually being able to give you whatever you want when you ask a query off of us. Okay. So that's the that's broadly the two parts that we do. So what kind of data set do you have to play with? Uh, multiple sure? different data sets that we play with. I mean, primarily right now, there are two main areas that we are focusing on. One is personal information, that is, the stuff on your desktop. Yeah. As much as you might think that stuff on your desktop is not that much amount of data, it can actually get to be enormous. Oh, yeah. And wading through that and being able to find the kind of things that you want from a desktop is very different from what you would want to find from, say, uh, going to an internet search. Yeah. They're two very different things. Because this is around the contacts I have, the people that I interact with, and the type of information that I have for my day-to-day -day use so that I can get forward with my work. Yeah. So, are you doing things like photos, or no? I, right now, we are, we are basically what we our focus is on being able to move from just simple search into actually putting some semantics into search. That is, when a user asks a query, be able to go beyond just simply the keywords and be able to draw a conclusion as what is it that the user wants, and we'll be able to serve the user better. 
Okay. Okay. So it, I know how Google works, right? And we we we've started changing our uh, mm -hmm. how we think almost because of mm -hmm. Google almost wants to see you know th two or three keywords, mm -hmm. right? So if you're looking for uh, you know research done at IBM Research mm -hmm. Center, you don't say a whole sentence. Absolutely. You don't say, hey, what kind of research Absolutely. was done at the IBM Absolutely. Research Center between 1970 and 1990? Mm -hmm. You sort of do IBM Research Center Absolutely. <laughs> research. Right? Absolutely. You know, That's precisely the goal. The goal is to be able to still retain these two, three keywords, yeah. not allow you to go beyond, or not necessarily require, require you to go beyond that, still be able to pull out whatever I can. Uh, I, I can I can easily give you an example that will sort of punch the point through. Me okay? I'm actually going to give you the example that was responsible for us initially starting off in this specific project. Okay. Okay. Um, I had a student. He was a PhD student at Stanford, and he was spending two years with us, and he was a PhD student with me. I was sitting in Spain, and we were trying to finish up a final version of a paper that we had gotten accepted into a conference. Yeah. And I was trying to get in touch with him sitting in Spain. I was trying to find his phone number in my email, in my email collection. Yep. Okay. Now, over two years, he had sent me about 400 emails, out of which two contained his actual phone number. Yep. Okay. I've, I've actually done that exact same search. I so. could not find his phone number. Yeah. I could not. His name is, uh, let's for the sake of argument, call it John. Yeah. And my queries were John phone on yeah. a regular way. I could not find it. Right. John phone number, John phone, John number. Exhausted everything. Finally, what I had to do was find one of his emails, sort by his emails, so that I have all of his emails together, and then keep hunting down one by one yeah. by one until I found that one email, making it. So, you obviously relate to it. I totally. Now this is one I, for a guy like me who uh, lives and dies by phone numbers. I, I do that all the time. Right? Phone number is one example. If you go to a larger corporate environment, yeah. there are tons and tons of business processes that we are working with, where on a regular basis we are trying to find that one email or a document or the chat message that I had with somebody the other day. Yeah which is going to spawn out the business process that I'm going to go for. And this type of search is very different from the type of searches you do on the internet. Yeah. There you're looking for the web page to go. Here you're really not looking for that web page as much as that piece of information that's hidden. Yeah. I don't care which email I bring you of that person. As long as that email contains the phone number that you want, you're done. Yeah. It's, it's a little bit more complex. Most of the time what people do is basically say, the best way to reach me is at. Yeah. And then there's a phone number after that. So. Being able to wade through this and being able to recognize the fact that this is a phone number, and as I'll show you in a moment, we do a little bit more than that. We actually can relate individual phone numbers to the, P to the individual person and be able to tell you this phone number belongs to that person yeah. and down to that level. So that's part of the research that uh, we're doing. In fact, we have a system out there which we've released. Well, as, as a user now, I'm, I'm thinking, man, I, I better change my signature to have phone and cell, the words phone and cell in my signature so that when you're Correct. searching for phone or cell, mm -hmm. you'll find my number. Mm -hmm. it's, I, I don't really need for you to put down phone or cell. If you put down phone or cell, we'll use that information also. Okay. But the fact that US phone numbers are three digits followed by a hyphen followed by three digits followed by four digits. Here's one example. Yeah. Okay. Now. Inside of organizations, people don't necessarily always give three digits, three digits, and four digits. They sometimes give it as three digits and just the four, just the last seven numbers, or even extension numbers and so on. So you don't have to give me a clue of that sort. You, as long as these are phone numbers in an acceptable form, we'll be able to find it. Okay. okay. Now that sounds like a lot of programming because you have to think of all the use cases in the world that you would, you know, phone numbers are pretty obvious, right? Correct. Because it, that's the first one you try Correct. to do that starts. Correct. But it, you know. Human beings are weird, you know, <laughs> and they come up with the weirdest Absolutely. things that they're looking for out of Absolutely. their information stores. Absolutely. You, know. you nailed down on the exact problem. That, so as I mentioned to you before, the, the group was involved in two main projects. Yeah. One is the search side of things, but one is the actual analysis side of things. Yeah. Over a period of the last about three years or so, we built some very powerful tools that allows us to be able to express these needs in very, very simple ways. Yeah. So we have tried to take away as much as possible. I'm not going to say that you know, it's come to a point where programming completely goes away. But it's certainly every single day that we are here, we have made the task of being able to extract that piece of information from text easier and easier and easier to a point that a lot of people can do it themselves. Now this research, and mm -hmm. I, we just visited Microsoft's Research Center too, and so a lot of times this is research that hasn't been productized yet, mm -hmm. right? Is, is, has your work been productized yet in any way? So um, people on the outside, it, 
fast company that come can actually try it. So a couple of things. One is the the thing that I'm going to show you today itself is available on what IBM calls as AlphaWorks. Okay. And AlphaWorks is where alpha technology that we have built and we want to try and get users to uh, give us some feedback that's available. So this today for um, Lotus Notes and for Outlook is available for people to download and play. Besides that, the actual technology that does the analytics and identifies this individual piece of information um, will, act, will be available, general, uh, general availability with Lotus Notes. Okay. Uh, next version. And so it's been released in Lotus Sphere in January, so that, uh, that I think later this year sometime is going to be available in general availability. Very cool. Yeah. Where do I find this, by the way? Uh, in something? AlphaWorks. Uh, Very cool. So that's uh, alphaworks at ibm.com slash tech slash... Email search. Email search. Yep. We'll put that in there somewhere. Okay. So, so um, where do I go with this? Uh, how many people are working on your team? Uh, the team itself is distributed across multiple countries. Yeah. We have a team of about five people working here locally here with me, yeah. and uh, three in Haifa and two in India. So this is genuinely a research effort across multiple different labs. Yeah. And each one of these places actually has their own uh, um, um, expertise that they bring into this. Yeah. And we've tried to bring all of those things are, together. Are you doing, is this you're doing multilingual, are you doing language research as well? Because like my wife is uh, Iranian and mm -hmm. she sometimes writes a little bit of Farsi in her emails. Mm -hmm. and, and she gets Farsi emails from Iran and mm -hmm. from our other places. And sometimes they have English and Farsi mixed in. And, and then she's looking for information, sometimes in English and sometimes in Farsi. Does that really complicate your job? Uh, it definitely com complicates the job. Yeah. And uh, right now, today, so let me answer this question in two ways. Okay? One was, whenever we talk about internationalization in emails, there are two parts to it. Yeah. One part of it is recognizing phone numbers. I told you recognizing phone numbers in the U.S. is 3, 3, and 4, right? Yeah. You go outside the U.S., it changes. Yeah. In India, it's different. In Europe, it's different. And all over the world, it's very different. Yeah. So the first part of our internationalization is being able to recognize phone numbers in multiple parts of the world, yeah. which we do. Okay. Yeah. Second thing is being able to recognize addresses and people names across multiple parts of the world. Yeah. So all of those things are stuff that we are uh, continuously improving, and we actually do a fair amount today. Okay? Yeah. Uh, in terms of being able to do genuine language research itself, that's next on our agenda. It's not right now. It's not something we do right now. Interesting. Mm -hmm. what, what have you learned by doing this research? What, you know, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you the most important thing that I've learned. The most important thing that I've learned is whenever you are going to provide information back to the individual user from their laptop, you better be correct every single time you bring the information back. People react very, very strongly. So. Um, in normal keyword search, I don't know whether you've had this experience. I'm going to give you one experience that I've had, and then I'm going to use that to convince. Uh, have you ever had the experience where you typed in something into Google, a page comes up, you open that page, and then you hunt for the word that you've typed in yep. that page, and you're not able to find it? Yeah. Okay? And then, annoyingly, when you go to the cached part of it, what it tells you is that, hey, here is a mechanism by which a page is, you know, these are words that appear in the pages that point to this particular page. Yeah. Now here's a situation where Google is not able to, or any other search engine is not able to associate the fact that a particular keyword actually did not appear in the page itself, but it came from a different mechanism. Yeah. And we use that information to be able to provide you uh, a page. In semantic search, the problem just gets magnified dramatically. Yeah. When you have a situation where you type in a keyword, and I am going to use the semantics, so you typed in the keyword phone, I translated that internally into a sequence of digits that looks in a certain way and bring you back an email that contains that sequence of digits, I better be able to communicate that semantics back to you cleanly. Yeah. If I don't do a good job of communicating that semantics to you, you're going to be very confused. Yeah. So the thing that we learned most over here was the fact that anytime personal information is being delivered back to the user, you have to make sure that you speak the same language that the user has in their mind. Yeah. And that's been a... Uh, and, big part and, of our challenge. Of course, research, a big part of research, I bet you have a user testing lab. Absolutely. You, you, know, you try out your theories Absolutely. with real users and see how Absolutely. they react, right? Absolutely. A, Absolutely. A, a mirror or something so you can't, they can't see you. But. That's part of our evaluation. AlphaWorks, the, way, the reason we put out into AlphaWorks is another way of being able to gather free, uh, information back from the rest of the users. Yeah. So this part of our feedback is as important as all of the other research that we've done being able to make sure that the user understands what we will be giving them back. Yeah. Tell me about the technology underneath this. How, how did you build that? What, what languages, what tools, what's on your desk when you're coding? Um, so the interface itself is just a normal browser. 
Okay. And in the case of Outlook, uh, we built it both for Outlook and for, uh, for Notes. In the case of Outlook, we actually surface a keyword search mechanism inside of Outlook itself. You can see it inside Outlook. Are you using Visual Basic or C Sharp? No, everything is, everything is in Java. Java, yeah. okay. And uh, the, the technology actually consists of three parts to it. One part of it crawls the local desktop, and in our case, for, for emails, both Outlook and for, and for Lotus Notes, collects them all and does this fairly intensive processing where we go through every email and try and identify all of these extra semantics that we need to be able to. Um, one index is a normal keyword index that any key search engine goes ahead and builds. And we also build what we refer to as our translation index or semantic index or our metadata index. When a keyword search comes along, we execute the keyword search against our metadata, which tells us, hey, you know what, a person a query that has come through is not just a normal keyword query. I know something more about this particular keyword query. Now, using that information that I know something more about that query, the system actually internally generates all possible things that you could have potentially meant with that keyword query. Prunes out a whole bunch of things, throws it away, grabs hold of two it knows are the most appropriate for your keyword query, surfaces that result back to you, and asks you, is this what you want? Are you going to hook it up to other web systems? Because obviously I'm putting my phone number now on my blog, mm -hmm. and Facebook, mm -hmm. and MySpace, on LinkedIn, and other places, on FriendFeed now, on mm -hmm. uh, feed, feed friend, friend mm -hmm. feed. You know, I, so my phone number is all over the place, and like right now I'm changing my phone number. So my old phone number is in some places, right. my new phone number is in right. other places. Right. Are you going to be able to build a system that first looks at your uh, inf personal information store and then starts trolling out and looking out? So think of translating that exact thing that you said to within an enterprise. IBM's focus on software is primarily within an enterprise. Yeah. So exactly all those things that you said, our direction is towards building that thing for within the enterprise. Yeah. So I'm sitting inside of an enterprise, and let's say Rob works in my company. Can I call you Rob? Yeah. Robert? Rob. Mm -hmm. Okay, Rob. Uh, I type in Rob phone. It will be smart enough to go look at all of the places that it needs to to be able to get the phone number back to me, but within an enterprise. Very cool. So our goal is to make that easy within an enterprise. Yeah. No problem. Mm -hmm. Can I just see how sure. it works? So here's an example. My query is Douglas phone. Yep. Okay. And now, it's a reasonable assumption that what you're looking for is Douglas's phone number. And the system comes back to you. And on top, it has shown you Douglas's phone number. Okay. And what you see below are normal keyword search results. OK? Yep. So on top, I'm going to take you quickly through this. And, and, and so the that's that can see phone that. That's, it didn't highlight the word phone, it highlighted the number. And exactly. That's really cool. Okay. And if you had Skype installed on your machine, which I don't, you just make a call right through from there. Wow, that's really nice. And I noticed you put the word phone number on the tag, so yep. somebody's like, why what did that this? show up? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And now, uh, going inside of this, now what I'm going to do is take you and show you. It said five emails, so let's see, why did it find five emails? So I'm going to take you in there. So Look this is looking at the information store on your desktop. Absolutely. Not, not just the corporate information That's correct. Store. This is only on my desktop over here. So if I go over here, and if you look at this particular email, this email is from Douglas Burdick. Yeah. Okay? And in the last sentence, it says, my phone number is. So this is not just simply bringing you back an email in which Douglas appears somewhere and a phone number appears somewhere. In this particular case, it knows the fact that this phone number belongs to because of the construction of the sentence before that. It's down to that level. Okay. Very cool. Well, this is interesting stuff and mm -hmm. uh, has some implications for how we do business together. I yes, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait to start trying, trying it out. So. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for uh, giving me a little look. Thank you.